I have amazing experts here today. Um, I'm so proud of Mary Ann Heronimo is with us today, Federation of um, Ethnic Communities Council of Australia CEO, FECA. Meg Polacek, um, Communications, Advocacy and Grants Manager, Australian Association of Gerontology. Nicholas Rittinghausen, uh, my dear colleague, Manager of our Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing. And um, Sylvia Wan, Senior Manager, HK Services, Care Support and Settlement Services, Social Participation Division, Southern Migrant and Refugee Centre. Welcome all. Mary Ann. What were the key strengths and limitations of the current HK diversity framework? How these, uh, did the impact the diversity of services to multicultural communities? Thank you for inviting me to this very important conversation. The HK uh, diversity framework and action plan, it's very important. When I joined FECA in 2019, um, that was you know, formally launched. It is a very important initiative that really showed how the sector can collectively work together in addressing access and equity issues in the aged care sector. And I think that's really the key driver of that. And I really commend um, everybody who's been involved in that whole process. But you see, while it identified specific actions for consumers, providers, and the government, it is apparent that it was not taken as a major piece of reference document. We can see and we have seen how the final report of the HK Royal Commission barely mentioned it um, in that document. And there's very little direct connection uh, with the work of the regulators. So I would say that, um, you know, in the end, uh, it's a piece of, you know, a series of recommendations, but unless, uh, the learning for us is unless something is embedded in legislation or in regulation and is mandatory, it will remain just a list of recommendations. So. It's really the kind of limitation that we have um, in that you know series of documents. They are all very important. The recommendations are really, really um, salient and significant to the sector, but it's not embedded. It's not mandatory, and so we still see that um, very um, high or significant limitation. I tend to agree with you, Mary, and as we you know, it's been some great efforts that have actually come out from this framework. Um, and and being a cold provider down here at Victoria, you know, we've found that we've got some guiding points that we feel that our colleagues, you know, and other agencies will be able to work by. But I think what you're saying, Marianne, is so true to what we're actually seeing as well. You know, the limitation is that there has been no general oversight of that framework. You know, while you've actually got the framework that that speaks about what the government is going to do, what the peak bodies are going to do, what the providers are going to do, and what the consumers are going to do, you know, there appears to be a step missing of how this actually gets translated so that it continues to be a living document and not just a document that we are putting out, you know, and ticking some of the boxes, you know, for providers like the Southern Migrant and Refugee Centre, you know, we, we, we deal every day with um, cold communities, you know, and we're trying on both ends to help them understand what's actually happening, likewise in the reform, in the legislation, so that they can actually play an active part in this rather than just a passive role of just allowing things to just happen and then receiving the end results of whatever's left over. I don't mean in such a bad way, but you know what I'm trying to say. So um, while I feel that the there are strengths to the framework, I feel that the limitations has been the lack of the oversight of how we continue to evaluate, how we continue to report and how we continue to monitor that what we have actually created here, you know, is actually implemented across everything that we're actually doing. There's a lot of work and I would like to recognize the department's work in this area. But again, there's so many of those uh, crucial aspects to it that remain recommendations, for example. So that's really the one remaining piece. It's almost like the pointy end of that whole series of initiative. If it if it's embedded and if it's legislated or uh, it's a man mandatory policy, then I think it will have a better um, outcome. You know, this framework, while it exists and it's there, it is the accountability of all of us you know, to embrace that framework and to actually continue to um, either improve on the framework through a feedback mechanism, you know, or implement that in our day-to-day -day lives, because then if not, it, be just, it just becomes a framework. Yeah, exactly. 
Yeah, totally agree. What should be key considerations in developing a multicultural HK strategy? What it uh, need to address to ensure it effectively addresses the unique needs of multicultural communities? I'm really very passionate about this um, issue and we've started to advocate for multicultural strategy because I think it's really important for the sector as we just um, heard from the panelists. And I think the, the, the diversity fund is a little bit toothless so, and we need to have a more strategic approach. We know that, for example, the NDA is developing a culture and diversity strategy. And as you said at the beginning, Selen, we have a very large proportion of non-English speaking um, background seniors in Australia. So we're not just actually a minority, we're large, the, the people are a large proportion of our society. What I'm going to talk about is more like a wish list because we don't, we are not at the stage where we, we at the moment want to have a discussion with the sector and see where we're going from here. And if there's going to, if we're going to come to get a decision, we're going to have a straight table, there needs to be right this um, consultation obviously by the department where relevant organizations are. So this is the very first start of our conversation today. As you said, Selene, it needs to link to the current age care reform um, and legislative um, um, documents. It needs to also, I think, address the diversity within the diversity of the uh, of the multicultural senior community, whether it's LGBTI, whether it's regional, whether it's care leavers, and so on and so forth. And I think also needs a little bit of culture diversity reporting of providers because we, we're good on other things like wound management, but what about culture diversity reporting? And then also that links to that data, the data um, a driven approach to measure uptake of seniors from different communities um, of our, you know, of different services, whether it's CHSP, home care, whatever it is. And the other thing is, I think also important is, you know, specific issues that are relevant for the multicultural sector, whether it's sustainability of little or smaller providers um, in the aged care sector, whether they're from the CHSP sector, for, for example, but also a strategic approach to how we support new and emerging communities in aged care. What can we do in terms of capacity building for them to make sure that um, the aged care sector responds to their specific needs? I think it needs that really targeted and specific approach and put it all together in a strategy. Another point is obviously things like, you know, the multicultural aged care workforce, racism happening as well, could be that this is a huge different issue or sep could be really a separate issue as well, an additional issue. When we talk about work with this is a huge issue. Things like multi multilingual communication, whether it's through my HK or any other platforms. And then I just put the last point is um, when we talk about research, you know, do we have inbuilt uh, mechanisms where we say, look, every survey should be translated when it's a research. So should that be inbuilt? Or, you know, if there's a, if their surveys are in, in multilingual form, that should be part of research, but that should be maybe mandated. So these are just some of the many points of our wish list that I just highlighted. There are many other points, but I'll leave it there. This is a high level conversation. We always knew it would be. Um, but for us, one of the key considerations is to collect, use and share high quality data. So to provide inclusive and individualized care, we need consistent, timely and accurate data. And um, we've recently published a paper with uh, Nikki and some other colleagues on the importance of diversity data, particularly language um, knowledge in the sector. And more importantly, we need to use that data. So every policy needs an implementation and evaluation component. And I think here I'm echoing my colleagues on the panel who are saying that, you know, we're getting policies and we're getting information, but we're not using it consistently. And if I may, I'd like to illustrate with a quick anecdote from when I was working as a personal carer in residential aged care. So I was helping a woman um, who I had been told was nonverbal and I sneezed, this was before COVID, thankfully, and she said Gesundheit. Now, Gesundheit is German for bless you. I answered her in German, and we had a lovely conversation. So here we had a good organization with good people working hard, policies and procedures for everything, including ticking boxes for languages spoken by residents and staff. And nobody had connected the dots between a resident who was indeed verbal, but in her language, and a staff member, me, who could speak the language. My point here is that solutions 
don't always cost money. The systems are often there, but we're not using them properly. Another really important point for us at the Australian Association of Gerontology is how to facilitate improvements to policy and practice for older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. So we don't believe that it is appropriate or effective for them to be included as an action plan under a broader framework. Um, we think that they um, certainly deserve and would benefit more from a specific Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations framework. framework. And I do note that the government is doing work in this space, including with the new National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, Age and Community Care organisation. The final point is we really need to be careful that we don't focus just on residential aged care. It's a tendency and it's easier. Of course, it's critical, but we know that the vast amount of older people in Australia are and want to age in their own homes. Less than 10% of government funded programs are in residential aged care. Also, and I'll come to this later, hopefully, is that if we can keep people in their own communities, they've often already forged connections with communities where they have shared values and shared interests. I just want to recognize what Nikki and Meg has said earlier. They're all on point, really very important uh, recommendations. But I always say also that FEC has always advocated for a development, for the development of a multicultural aged care strategy. And our response to the final report of the Aged Care Royal Commission somewhat summarizes that. Even our work in FECA, where it's really, as, as Meg said, very high level policy development work, I would like to highlight that there's, in fact, two very significant policy windows when, it, when we talk about, you know, what we would like to see in a multicultural aged care strategy. One of that, as we all know, is the new Aged Care Act and the, an exposure document came out, you know, a few weeks ago. And the other one is the Multicultural Framework Review, which I hope everyone is very familiar with because it's already out and um, it's, you know, a final report will come out um, by end of March to very significant policies that we need to look at. And when we think about developing a multicultural age care strategy, we need to con contextualize this within these two policies. Otherwise, we will be back to where the diversity framework is at. Lots of words, but limited impact. On the exposure draft of the new Age Care Act, uh, we are very pleased that, to see that the, there's an adoption of a rights-based approach. However, um, in FECA submission, uh, our key recommendation is that the respect for diversity and equity are placed at the core of a fair and inclusive act. So that means there are very specific um, call out and mention to uh, diversity or more equitable system that's very important, not just equitable access, because no matter what you do, if the system does not allow for things to be equ equitably accessed, then we will have a problem. So these are one of those key things. And when we mention about high quality care, we want to say that culturally appropriate care must really say that there are policies and practices that will ensure services are culturally appropriate. You won't find that in the current Aged Care Act, I mean, the current um, version of it. And it's very critical for us that the Act must say that there has got to be secure funding for sustainable community-based cloud navigation services. I think this is really, really important. On the Multicultural Framework Review, which I said earlier will come out towards end of March, the government said it's really critical um, to make sure that we're able to make recommendations on what institutional arrangements or what should be there to make sure that policies, um, legislative settings are in place. So we are ready for the current and the future needs of multicultural Australia. So the key recommendation from FECA is to ensure that the machinery of government, so that there, are, there are institutions in place to make sure that it's going to work. And foremost of this is the establishment of an office for multicultural Australia, which number one, I will be tasked to develop a multicultural framework. This is an overarching multicultural framework. And um, the office will ensure consistency of all and coherence of all implementation of Australia's multicultural framework and action plan, in which if we look at a framework in aged care, this will have to be aligning with that. So if you have that overarching policy, 
it should not be a hard advocacy work from our sector to always say we need to have this we, because the the government is already in that um, direction trying to you know figure out an overarching uh, multicultural uh, framework so there are eight pillars that we have um, really highlighted in our submission number one is fair and inclusive society inclusive policy design access and equity to support and services effective communication full participation empowered communities language which everybody has um, spoken about Evidence and data, it's which Meg is really strong, you know, this AAG is really important work. So I will share a link to our submission to the Multicultural Framework Review. We'll see more details of what we are recommending. So what I'm saying basically is that we'd like what Feka is saying is when we, when we talk about a multicultural aged care framework, we need to be contextualizing these under these two very important policy uh, windows, and we'd like to work with everybody on that. Sylvia, I think that so you wanted to add something as well. I, I think Marianne actually summed it up really well because I was actually I was actually looking from a lens of um, our community, you know, um, where we are actually connected to. And Marianne, you are so right, you know, in saying that there needs to be clear equity uh, of access. There needs to be clear communication, you know, and, and, and there also needs to be consultation in a lot of ways that will continue to shape the way that, um, that we're actually leading this. But Meg, also to answer, uh, to sort of add on to what you were talking about, how aged care is not not just limited to um, residential facilities or very minor limited to the residential facilities. When we look at aged care, we look at hospitals as well, where sometimes you do get a, a, a number of our, you know, of older people actually in hospitals, you know, and likewise, we have actually heard, um, my company in itself, we have actually heard, um, you know, um, feedback on how not responsive hospitals are to the needs of cold individuals, you know, by not even, um, you know, a simple thing of your, 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 your care, your personal care and having the gender, you know, that is looking after um, that care needs, you know, where is that consultation process actually? So I, I do agree with everything that's been said. Based on your experience, what policy recommendations would you make? I'm going to throw a bit of a curveball into the room and say that we actually disagree with the right space approach to the new app. And the reason for that is that it is positioned as a consumer rights approach. We advocate for a human rights approach. The problem with the consumer rights approach is that it applies only, it puts a commercial model over something. So this premise that a consumer choice will drive sector development, it, it's not evidence-based. It's ideological, which is great, but there, it isn't supported by the evidence. It's also incorrect to assume that older people want or and, and or are able to participate in what's essentially sh service shopping. So, yeah, we, we are concerned that it should rather um, have a values-based human rights approach, um, not a market-based uh, silo. We do know, of course, that we need a more dynamic approach, um, particularly when it comes to the great diversity in, in our population. Um, and that's also going to require a different balance or matching between um, bureaucratic expectations in, in terms of, you know, the HK quality standards or frameworks and things, the funding models, and then uh, the need to not just incorporate, but actually celebrate diversity um, within that. So I'm going to go back to the data as well and say that one of our policy recommendations is certainly that the approach must be evidence-based and we need more and better statistical analysis of the nuances of cultural and diversity data. Um, another thing, and it's also probably, you know, might come across as a bit of a surprise in, in the study that we recently published, um, which was in residential aged care, so mea culpa, we need to do one in community care. But we found that one in five older residents who were born 
in a non-English speaking country prefer to speak English. So we mustn't assume that because somebody is born in a certain place and time that we actually know them. So there's real importance of understanding the individuals and the communities and also not confusing geography with um, some sort of homogenous group of people. If you can think of different countries where languages like Arabic are spoken or more, I hope I don't offend anyone in the room, but I find it very difficult to, to understand English with a Scottish accent. So not to make assumptions um, about how we communicate with people. Another really important um, component, which I'm sure that um, everybody will agree with, is the level of training um, and support for the, the frontline staff, who I always picture sort of a reverse pyramid where the, the personal care staff, and I've been one of them, they are the top, because these are the ones who engage with the people um, every day. So making sure that they understand diversity principles, being aware of any unconscious bias, um, and also understanding how to how training can be informed by the skills and experiences of the of the community. We're also curious about whether the aged care award under which um, many of the staff are paid could actually include provisions. Um, to promote or remunerate people who um, obtain additional cultural and linguistic skills. It could be a way to attract and reward workers and also ways that perhaps different staff could be shared across facilities in the same region. We also propose a life course approach. The idea here, of course, is that if somebody is already involved in their own community, and perhaps with services, um, they've already shared their migration-related experiences, needs, or preferences, um, and know how to tap into the services that are best suited to support them. And so from this perspective, again, a life course approach, not just from the individual, but from policymakers, because the policies and the service providers could be building long-term positive relationships with the migrant groups, not just initiating it um, when people are older. I know there's a lot of good work going on in this sector. Um, another thing, and again, probably a bit of a contrary view, is just a caution that we don't assume that it's no specific service that's always the answer. Um, you know, it probably sounds a bit counterintuitive and, and perhaps um, contentious, but that option is often not available to people. Um, it can be difficult getting the bilingual staff um, to be available or accessible. And also there, there are particular risks with ethno-specific services. Um, for example, if they're minority groups, um, and also, regardless of what service you're in, for somebody with dementia, it's still probably going to fall on the family to provide that additional support. So certainly not saying it's a bad thing. I'm saying we mustn't just fall into that familiar pattern of thinking that there's um, the quick fix. And I suppose my final comment is that we not only focus on need, but also on preferences. I think that's a really good point that we talk about intersectionality approach that we talk about diversity within diversity and there's like the diversity is huge in multicultural communities but i still think it needs a targeted approach whether it's through a multicultural strategy and, and how we link it what marianne said maybe to the multicultural framework view i just want to say i think if we get to a point of a strategy we definitely have like good um, good actions and recommendations linked to a strategy and I would be really interested to see, because today we're really opening up for the first time to the sector, our our sort of ideas and this, and thoughts. And I would be interested to see how we can bring on this the sector on this journey. I and mean, this is the first conversation today we're having, obviously, today. So um, I'm really curious to see um, how can we include you in the conversation, that's because that's today the first time. I think one of the things that we've actually all touched, touched on as well is the importance of consultation. And... What I would like to say, I mean, this is, we've put this in our response to the new, to the um, exposure bill um, consultation as well, is that consultation must be meaningful. 
Now, that sounds all very la-la and, you know, try it. But give people enough time to respond, you know, which we haven't been given with the exposure, exposure bomb. And that meaningful consultation needs to be presented, not just in how we, um, you know, in time or in opportunity, but in how we communicate. And we've, all of us, I think, have touched on that. Um, how we actually engage. One of the um, inconsistencies in the exposure bill um, consultation was that what was actually in the full documents was different to some of the materials provided in plain language. So there wasn't context. So, you know, there's a real risk that we don't get accurate data. Here I go again, but accurate data. And so that that consultation or engagement is not as meaningful as it could be. Meg, I think it's really important. It's crucial when you emphasize consultation. When I joined FECA in 2019, I think I've spoken to maybe about more or less 400 older people across the country. And it's always heartbreaking. It's, you know, there's a lot of inspiring stories of people trying to help each other, but Broadly, it's always very heartbreaking. I guess, number one, I think when we look at a multicultural aged care strategy, I always want to pose the question of, are we just looking at all the people who are already in aged care, receiving care and addressing whether the care is actually appropriate for quality care, blah, blah, blah. A huge proportion of all the people are actually not there. And that is where a key advocacy for FECA. That's why we have been, you know, really working hard in terms of accessing, you know, um, you know, doing a navigation service because number one, as you said, Meg, most older people are in the community. We don't get to hear about them. There's not a lot of structure or framework to actually see how they're experiencing aged care, but the mm -hmm. highest or most number of older people are actually not receiving anything. They're just out there just trying their best to be able to enter the system. And we are concerned about that because if they are unable to enter the system, that means they don't have a say. Even if you have a new Age Care Act, which looks at people who are in the system, you're actually not looking at the welfare of the broader number of uh, older population in which many of them are actually from multicultural backgrounds. So that's one one kind of question that I would like to pose. So we need to really consider how do we want to approach this, uh, Nikki, moving forward. But again, yes, it needs to be very strategic. It needs to be aligned with policies that are already being in place. And we need to work around these policies and you know, see how we can strategically make sure that the impact of the work that we're doing will deliver the outcomes that actually older people want to see in the system, because if you can have conversations with them in consultations, um, that is the question that they will ask, have asked me many times, what's the difference, Marianne? You've asked me the same question in 2019, maybe now it's 2020, 2023. It's the same question. What's the difference? I have a very um, the related questions about that, Marianne. If the panel have any opinion on policy advocacy or collaborative practices, for alignments between state and federal policies to prevent duplication and enhance sector resources optimization. I must say, Selen, that aged care is uniquely federal because the policies are at the federal level. I'm not saying that the state government doesn't have a role, but the way it's structured at the moment, it's uniquely federal. And that's why you would see FECA doing quite a fair bit of work in this area. Um, but yes, we need to really figure out how the state level, you know, um, institutions can have a role because as we have someone mentioned earlier, it's community-based. It's where the rubber hits the road. You know, that's where the policies would matter. One of the key um, elements, you know, looking from a provider's um, status, you know, is the resourcing that's also needed then to ensure that everything that we have actually spoken about is actually coming into fruition. You know, so how how well... Are we resourced? Um, Meg, I love what you had 
um, spoken about, you know, about consideration of remuneration to even um, bicultural workforce that can speak the language, you know, and that can act as a, a stronger advocate or a stronger information kind of a platform towards the consumer and towards um, providers or towards the federal level as well. So I think all these needs to be taken into a, a, a broader kind of a context. I'd like to um, jump in and just comment actually on something Marianne said and you, Sylvia. So, Marianne, the consultation is so crucial wherever and whenever we can do it. But one of the things we must all remember is to close the loop. So people know, you know, they're not silly. They know that you can't have one-on-one -on -one magic wand, you know, the solutions uh, for support. But when we ask for their opinion, when we ask for their input even if we can't change something or fix it we must go back and tell them what we've done with that information um and the other thing getting back uh to the workforce sylvia what you raised i mean we all know that recruitment and retention is is catastrophic so you know that's an additional challenge is you know you're looking at training people who may not want to stick around so yes yeah, how do we um, attract good people who are there for the right reasons and hopefully things like the recruitment and, and remuneration is something you know further down the track that can that we can lever off leverage off as well She asked the question what people think about mandatory diversity reporting and actually the majority of the ones who participate in our um, trainings actually said we should have that now i think i would agree with sylvia if organizations need to man need to report on diversity or or cultural inclusion we need to support hk providers to do that but i think from a philosophical point of view whether it's mandatory or not, this is another conversation because there's already so many regulations happening and providers may maybe feel pressured. So I think it maybe should be highly encouraged. I'm not sure if it should be really mandatory because that is, um, you know, already there's so many things already happening. But at the same time, it should be at the same level as, you know, wound management. Why is wound management or other things we're reporting that we're not reporting on culturally diversity? Absolutely agree, Nikki. The focus on clinical care needs to shift to sort of a, the social and cultural care. It's just so much harder for the government to quantify. That's um, part of the problem. But what I would say to everybody here is that I've attended a lot of um, the forums presented by the Centre for Cultural Diversity and Ageing, and they're really brilliant. You always learn something. The only risk in our sector is that we have this opt-in bias because the people who come along are probably the ones who already um, get it. So I don't know how do we engage with those hard to reach um, services or, you know, whether it's the workers or the, um, the communities, it's, it's really tricky. is a good one for Sylvia because you are at the same time multicultural but also you know have your specific social support groups. Absolutely Nikki thank you for that yes SMRC is multicultural yes we actually service um, well over I think 26 or different cultures you know and each culture is different it's never putting you know a specific framework over what we we are needing to do and the key point to it I come back to this is how do we consult you know, how do we actually consult in a meaningful way, like what you're saying, Meg, that will actually give us the information of how then we need to channel our services. You know, it's it's the other way around. You know, we, we speak about organizations leading the way, you know, but we're not actually leading now. We're actually putting our consumers in the front and we're telling them, you lead the way and you tell us what is it that you want us to do. Now, with that requires a very different approach because you have to be prepared to be shifted out a little bit out of your skin to be able to do that. You know, when you put that, there's a little bit of vulnerability that comes into the forefront when you start turning the ball inside out. It requires us to look at a lot of things, you know, what and, and test ourselves. Before you can even go out there, you need to ask yourselves, 
how how are we actually going to approach this? You know, if you're not going to do it well, then you're better off actually not doing it. So if you're going to do it, then you've got to find that framework that will support you in doing it. And this is why we've got consumer advisories. You know, we're trying to lead up the advisory groups in all levels. Um, and the dream would be to eventually let these advisory groups dictate the way it is and chair the meetings. That's actually turning the whole thing around. I also believe that the specialization verification framework will help in some sense to actually embed some of the accountabilities and the responsibilities, you know, that we say that we're actually going to do. It doesn't, uh, I know that, you know, it, it narrows in a little bit more, but it does actually put some accountability when you do put in that specialization um, uh, certification. It's not just a certification. You've got to actually make sure that you meet all these requirements and evidence based that you're meeting it. And in three years time, check upon what you've actually said that you were going to deliver as well. Thank you so much. It's a mind-blowing conversation. Thank you so much, everyone.